Okay, so what is chemical bonding, right? So bonding is what essentially forms our molecules. Right now, we kind of have some sort of idea with respect to bonding. Um, what two types of bonds do we have right now before we even start talking about this? We have ionic bonds and we have covalent bonds, right? And so what is the difference between them in just kind of our understanding of it right now? Ionic bonds, what happens? There's a transfer of electrons, right? We form ions, and it's the attraction of those two ions that actually form the bond. What about covalent bonding? What's happening in covalent bonding? They're sharing, okay? So that's where we're kind of coming in um, with the understanding that we have right now, okay? So in the next two chapters, we are gonna introduce you guys to three separate bonding theories. The first one is called Lewis theory, and it's essentially what this chapter deals with. The second is valence bond theory. And the third is molecular orbital theory. So why do you think we would need three separate theories to explain bonding? No one knows. That's true. No, I don't even know half the time, right? So um, the idea behind this is that these three theories differ with respect to one another in kind of a reciprocal relationship between accessibility versus actual explanation of what we really see, right? So Lewis theory is going to be the most accessible theory that we have. Okay, anyone can make Lewis structures. You guys made Lewis structures already in the lab this semester before we even talked about Lewis structures, right? So you can draw Lewis structures right now, okay? Lewis theory though, on the other hand, doesn't explain exactly what we see all the time. It's not the best theory in explaining actual results and experimental data with respect to bonding, okay? So then valence bond theory is kind of the next little step up it is going to be less accessible, so it's gonna be harder to understand, but it's gonna explain bonding a little bit better. And then finally comes the granddaddy of all of the theories of bonding, molecular orbital theory. So this is gonna be the hardest to understand. It's gonna be the most complex. It's also gonna be the most important for when you move on to organic chemistry, right? If you wanna be successful in organic chemistry, understanding molecular orbital theory will be important, but because it's so complex, it also means it explains bonding really, really well, right? So it essentially takes quantum mechanics, applies it to bonding, and explains bonding in terms of quantum mechanics, which is really what's actually happening in the actual world today, okay? Okay, all right, so we're gonna start with Lewis theory, which again, is the most accessible, the easiest, but is gonna have the most exceptions to it, or the most issues with it, and actually explaining bonding, okay? So, Lewis theory, big idea behind this, is this gonna explain bonding in terms of valence electrons, okay? What we're gonna get out of Lewis theory are gonna be models, which is what we call Lewis structures. So we're gonna draw our little bonding of molecules in terms of Lewis structures. These are also called electron dot structures. Lewis theory and Lewis structures are gonna kind of be the bedrock of bonding, right? We're always gonna start, regardless of what we're even trying to explain, with drawing the Lewis structure of a molecule. It's gonna be kind of something that you're gonna continuously use um, throughout the remainder of the semester as well as into organic chemistry, okay? So Lewis theory is gonna help us understand and predict a couple of different things. One of the biggest one is the shape of molecules. So shape and overall three-dimensional structure of molecules is a very important tool with respect to Lewis structures as well as molecule polarity. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the chapter. Okay, so Lewis theory. Lewis theory and Lewis structures. So what's the big idea behind Lewis theory, okay? So Lewis theory focuses on valence electrons. So what are the valence electrons in an atom? They are gonna be the electrons that are defined as those in the outermost principal energy level, right? So if I drew, let's say the electron configuration for carbon, so does anyone know the electron configuration for carbon? So 1s2, and then we move over 2s2. And then who comes next? Which orbitals do we fill next after 2s? 2p. And there are two of them that go in there. So this is the electron configuration for carbon. Who are the valence electrons? Who are the electrons in the outermost principal energy level? All of the electrons in which number? two, right? So outermost principal energy level is n equal to two. So all of the electrons that are in that n shell are the valence electrons. So the 2s2 and the 2p2 are all of the valence electrons. 
What are the rest of the electrons? What are they called? They're not valence, what are they? They are core electrons, right? So all of the other electrons are the core electrons. And what are they characterized by? What are they, what electrons are they? Where are they at? They're in the filled lower orbitals, the filled lower shells, okay? So everything that's not valence is essentially core. It's in these filled lower energy levels. Okay, so totally for carbon, how many valence electrons does it have? Four, right? So remember the superscripts refer to how many electrons are in each orbital. So there are four valence electrons for carbon. And then how many core electrons for carbon are there? Two, right? So two core electrons. Okay, so why does Lewis theory focus on valence electrons so much? So number one, big important thing to note, valence electrons are held the loosest with respect to atoms, okay? Why would they be held the loosest? What are they farthest away from? The nucleus, right? So the nucleus is withholding these electrons in. The valence electrons are the ones on the outermost principal energy level. So they're the ones that are going to be held the loosest by the nucleus, okay? With respect to bonding, what are we going to be doing with bonding? We're going to either be transferring in an ionic bond or doing what if we're making a covalent bond? Sharing, right? And so if we're going to be transferring electrons, we're going to be sharing electrons with other things, we're probably going to want to do that with the, the electrons that we held the loosest, right? And so that's why valence electrons come into such an important role with respect to bonding because, again, they're the ones that are going to be participating in bonding, okay? So because of that, Lewis theory focuses on the behavior of valence electrons. And that's what we focus on with respect to drawing Lewis structures is valence electrons. Okay, so valence electrons is going to be super important. How do we know how many valence electrons something has without having to draw out the electron configuration every single time? Right, so if we're dealing with main group elements, so remember main group are the first two columns and the last six columns. If we're dealing with main group elements, main group elements, there were two different ways that we could categorize the columns in the periodic table. There was the 1A, and that was all of the main group that moved over to 3A. What were the transition metals called right in the middle? What do we categorize them as in this little scheme? These we called these B. So we labeled the columns as the Bs for the transition metals. How many rows or how many columns, pardon me, do transition metals have? Depends on how many electrons you can put into your 5D orbitals. 10. So there are 10 essentially columns that we ignore when we're actually looking at main group. Okay, so the transition metals make up this little interior, ignore them entirely. Then, based off of what column it is, it's essentially going to tell you how many valence electrons it has as long as we're dealing with main group. So for hydrogen, lithium, sodium, this is in column 1A. How many valence electrons does column 1A have? One. One valence electron. What about column 2A? How many valence electrons does column 2A have? Two. What about 3A? Three, right? So moving on all the way to 8A, which is our noble gases, how many valence electrons do our noble gases have? Eight. Right? So this is a very quick and easy way to determine, based on the position in the periodic table, how many valence electrons an atom has. Okay? Okay, so that's great. What's next? Now we're going to start drawing our Lewis dot structure. Okay? So a couple things to note about that, the way we actually categorize things here. Number one, what we represent electrons as in our little Lewis dot structures is dots, okay? So electrons, we are going to represent as little dots like this, okay? Most importantly, what type of electrons are actually going to be represented in our Lewis dot structures? Valence electrons, right? So we only represent our valence electrons as these tiny little dots, okay? All of the core electrons and all of the nucleus as well for an atom is going to be represented by the chemical symbol. Okay, so the nucleus as well as the core electrons are going to be represented just by their chemical symbol. 
So for example, if I wanted to draw, let's say, the Lewis dot structure for just an atom of aluminum, aluminum, nucleus core electrons is going to be represented by the chemical symbol, and then how many valence electrons would aluminum have? Three, right? So it's in column 3A. There are three valence electrons, and the way I represent that in my little Lewis dot structure is just as single electrons around the four quadrant, four quadrants of aluminum. Why don't you think I would put them all together? Just like uh, something like this. What's wrong with that? In theory, there's nothing really wrong with respect to just putting them all in aluminum. That's not what we do though. But with respect to not pairing them early, what would that kind of be violating? Right, so notice I put one, two, three, and I didn't say one, two, three. Why wouldn't I do that? What principle would I kind of be violating in doing that? So remember when we put electrons into orbitals and we put them in singly first and then we went back and paired their spin? What was that called? Hun's rule, right? So we essentially put them around the outside and we follow Hun's rule. We put them around the outside singly first and then we will come back and pair their spin. So for example, if I were to represent phosphorus, phosphorus has five valence electrons. I would represent them singly first, and then I would come back and pair their spin, okay? Okay, so this is how we're gonna actually represent our valence electrons, our core electrons, and then everything else with respect to the atom in Lewis dot structures. Okay, so what's next? We're gonna ignore atoms. We don't care about atoms, right? What are we trying to do here? We're trying to make molecules. How do we make molecules? make bonds, right? Bonds and molecules, exactly what we have to deal with, okay? So what is the big idea or the big central theme behind Lewis theory, okay? So what Lewis theory posits, or what it essentially hypothesizes, is that atoms bond together because they're going to lower their potential energy, okay? So atoms will come together, they'll be at a really high potential energy state, when they come and make a bond, that's going to lower their potential energy. If that does so, then we're actually going to see a bond formation, okay? More stable molecule is going to be lower potential energy. The idea behind Lewis theory is that it states that atoms are going to do that by obtaining a series or eight various electrons around them in their valence shell, okay? So that's the big idea behind Lewis theory. They're going to lower their potential energy by obtaining eight electrons around them, okay? This eight electron idea is called the octet rule. So octet just means eight. Okay, so everyone in Lewis theory is trying to obtain eight electrons around it. So we can utilize Lewis theory to explain both ionic bonding as well as covalent bonding. So for example, if I drew the Lewis dot structure for sodium, so sodium, how many valence electrons does it have? First column of the periodic table, it has one. Right, and I drew the Lewis dot structure for chlorine, which lies in column 7A. How many valence electrons does chlorine have? Seven, right? Why do we see a transfer of electrons between sodium and chlorine? In this reaction, who gives up an electron? Sodium, who takes the electron? Right, so we're left with something that looks like this. Why would chlorine wanna do that? How many electrons does it have around it right now? Eight, right? That's a lower potential energy state for it. So it's gonna do whatever it can to get eight electrons around it. What about sodium, right? Sodium beforehand had an electron configuration of neon 3s1. When it loses that electron in the 3s orbital, who are the new valence electrons for sodium? So we draw out the electron configuration for neon. We have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. If these are gone, who are the new valence electrons for sodium? The 2s and the 2p. How many electrons are there? Eight, right? So by doing this, they both have eight electrons, right? That is the entire idea behind Lewis theory. We're trying to get eight electrons. When things have eight electrons, if they need to give it or they need to share it, then everything's going to be much more stable and bonds are going to form as a result of that, okay? Okay, so this is ionic bonding, which is not really what we care about too much in this chapter. Instead, 
we're going to be dealing with covalent bonding, right? So this was a transfer of electrons. With covalent bonding, what are we going to be doing instead? We're not going to be transferring electrons. We're going to be doing what? Sharing them, okay? So now that's the big idea behind Lewis theory in terms of covalent bonding is we're going to be sharing electrons so that everyone obtains an octet, an octet eight electrons around them, okay? Okay, so let's try to consider this when we consider covalent bonding. All right, so now let's think about something like water, right? So we know that water has a chemical formula of H2O. If we start to draw out the Lewis dot structures for our atoms that are involved, we have oxygen. How many valence electrons does oxygen have? Six, right? So six valence electrons for oxygen. So we'll draw those around our little oxygen and then we'll pair, okay? And then hydrogen, we have a little hydrogen that comes along. How many valence electrons does hydrogen have? Just little one guy, okay? So we have one hydrogen and we have our little oxygen together. What they're gonna do in forming this covalent bond is they're gonna share their electrons. So we've got an unpaired electron here and an unpaired electron here. When they combine and share their electrons, the way we represent that is this nice little two dots in between the two, okay? All right, so hydrogen, how many electrons does it have around it right now? Two, right? So anytime we have a bond, we get to count those electrons towards both of the atoms, right? So hydrogen has two electrons. Is that okay for hydrogen? Yes, yes it is. This hydrogen is one of the exceptions to this. Hydrogen can only obtain what is called a duet, right? So it can only have two electrons total. So hydrogen's fine. What about oxygen, though? How many electrons does it have around it right now? So right now we have two, four, six, and then seven. What else does it need to do to get an octet of electrons? If we have another little hydrogen pop on by, has another little electron, what can they do? They can share their electrons with respect to one another, and we end up with H, O, H. All right now, how many electrons does oxygen have? Eight. How many electrons does hydrogen have? Two. Everything's good, right? Everything's happy. Why does water form? Because this lowers the potential energy with respect to just single oxygen and single hydrogens, right? This guy with his eight electrons, super happy, super stable. That's why we actually see it form. Okay, so a couple of things that we have to define with respect to this structure. Go ahead and redraw it again. So I've got, I'll go back to black. We've got hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. And then we've got these two electrons around oxygen. So there are two different types of electrons in this structure right now, okay? There is what we call bonding electrons or bonding pairs. So bonding pairs comes in pairs. Right now we have this guy that's a bonding pair. It's forming a bond between two things and this guy. So in this structure, how many total bonding pairs do we have? Two. So for bonding pairs, we have two pairs. How many total electrons is that, though? Four. So note that a pair is two, right? They're always going to come in twos with respect to all of these bonds that we form, for the most part. So these guys are our bonding pairs. What about these guys up here that lie on oxygen? These guys aren't bonding with anyone, right? So we call these either lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. And again, for oxygen, how many lone pairs lie on oxygen right now? We have one up top and we have one down below. So how many lone pairs lie on oxygen? Two pairs. How many total electrons is that? Four total electrons. How many lone pairs lie on hydrogen? None, right? So you're just looking for lone pairs, things that just lie on these single atoms themselves, okay? Another thing to note, I don't like to draw Lewis structures like this, okay? Um, I don't like the dots. I will draw dots for lone pairs, but for me, and what you should move on to further on that you get, I like to represent bonds as single lines. Okay, so the better structure with respect to water would be a single line and a single line 
to represent what we call a single covalent bond. How many electrons, when I draw these, this is what happens when I try to talk and write, a single covalent bond, how many electrons are in each of these lines? That's the important thing to know. Two. So each line is always still just two electrons. Okay. And unfortunately, I just essentially stated it's on the next slide, right? So I get ahead of myself. All right, so again, better way to draw water would be with lines to represent these bonds. And one pair of electrons, one bonding pair, gives us our little single covalent bond. Okay, super easy. Now, what's next? What other types of bonds are there? There's double bonds, right? So why would we ever have a double bond come into account, right? So let's imagine that we have an oxygen and we'll draw a little Lewis dot structure for oxygen and it's around another oxygen. And we'll draw our little Lewis dot structure for this oxygen, right? So now, same type of thing, we have our little electrons can come together and share with each other. If we only form one bond there, then how many electrons does each oxygen have? Just seven, right? So now, what do we need to do to get everyone with eight electrons? Super happy. Then we have another little set of electrons that are unpaired together that can form another bond, right? So we make this. We have oxygen forming a double bond with another oxygen. And again, if we wanted to draw it with all these stupid little dots, we could do that. Okay, so this guy is what is called a double covalent bond. How many electrons are in our double covalent bond? Four total electrons, right? So essentially, two bonding pairs. Super easy. If we look and count our electrons, we've got eight that go to this guy, and we've got eight that go to this guy. So everyone has their octet, everyone is happy, okay? What about if we have something like nitrogen? Poor nitrogen only has five valence electrons, right? Comes into interaction and encounter another nitrogen, which only has five valence electrons. If we want to form bonds to give it eight, we could form this bond, that would only give it six, we could form this bond, that would give it seven. Now we could form this bond, that would give it eight for both of them, okay? So what is this gonna result in? A triple bond, right? So a nitrogen, pair, 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 with a nitrogen. How many lone pairs does each nitrogen have? Just one lone pair of electrons. Lone pair, lone pair. How many electrons does each nitrogen share with one another? Six total electrons. So a better way to draw this would be a nitrogen, three lines, two lone pairs on each one, one lone pair on each one, right? Okay, so this is called a triple covalent bond. Awesome, all right. Now, how are we actually gonna go about drawing Lewis structures, right? So I walked through, I said, oh, look at this, we can like put these guys together, and we can do this and we can do that. Do you think you're actually gonna to try to utilize that when I want you to draw these very complex structures? No, right? So instead, what's gonna happen is you guys are gonna follow these four steps that I provide for you in the next few slides on how to actually go about drawing the correct Lewis structure every time, okay? So what is the first step in drawing the Lewis structure for a molecule, okay? We're gonna take our compound, so for this guy, we want to draw the Lewis structure of NF3, okay? Number one first step is to draw the correct skeletal structure. So what I mean by that is the correct atom that's in the center surrounded by the correct things on the outside, okay? That may not be as simple as it seems. So there's going to be two different positions in each structure that I'm going to define, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and draw the correct structure here for this nitrogen trifluoride. Nitrogen is gonna go in the middle. We're gonna call this our central atom. The 
three fluorines are going to go on the outside of the nitrogens or one nitrogen okay these guys these fluorines on the outside we call these our terminal atoms they're in the terminal position they are not bonded to anything else except for our central atom now big question would be i told you that this is the correct skeleton structure for this how would you know how would you know what goes into the center and what goes into the outside So there's a term that we're going to introduce later on. It's called electronegativity. When you do come into that term, you know what it means, and you can know that the least electronegative element is always going to be in the center. Okay. Another good, helpful little hint is whatever comes first in the chemical structure, who comes first in this chemical structure? Nitrogen. Usually that's the least electronegative element. So whatever comes first is usually going to be in our center spot, and then everything else is going to be terminal to it. Okay, Okay. so step number one, correct skeletal structure. All right, so step number two, we are going to sum all of the valence electrons for our structure. Okay, so if I go ahead and redraw my nitrogen and my fluorines. Next step, we need to know how many valence electrons all of these atoms are bringing to our structure. Okay, so what are we going to do for that? Number one, we've got nitrogen. How am I going to know how many valence electrons it has? I'm going to go to something. It's called the periodic table. All right. I'm going to look at what column it's in. What column do you think nitrogen is in? Column with respect to main group. Fifth column. So nitrogen is going to bring us five valence electrons. Five electrons. And then fluorine. What column is fluorine in? Seven. Seven. I don't know how to do seven with my hands. Seven. So how many valence electrons is fluorine going to bring us? Seven. seven. How many of them are there? Three. All right. So we have three times fluorine. Gives us three times seven. What is three times seven? Twenty-one. So total, when I sum all of these guys together, we have 26 valence electrons to distribute. Okay? Step number two, sum the valence electrons. Step number three, sum the valence electrons. Okay, cool. We're going to start to distribute. Okay, so we have 26 to get rid of. We have our skeletal structure. So this is kind of where the hard part comes in, and people always get really confused or they do it incorrectly. Okay. First thing you're going to do is you're going to make single bonds between the central atom and each of the terminal atoms. Okay, so number one, I'm going to come in and draw a line between my central atom and all of my terminal atoms. Okay, how many electrons have I put into the structure at this point in time? Six. What's next? I'm going to fill the outer octets, right? So everything, all of my terminal atoms, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go fill through and fill their octets. How many do I need to put into each fluorine to fill its eight electrons? Six, right? So I'm going to go ahead and put them in as lone pairs on each of my terminal atoms. Then what am I going to do? I'm going to figure out, now that I put in everything that I have, how many electrons have I actually put in? I put in 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. How many do I have to get rid of? 26. So I have two more electrons. What do I do with those two electrons? I'm going to put them as a lone pair on the central atom, right? So you've distributed everything. You've filled in all of the outer octets. If you have excess electrons, you're then going to put them as a lone pair on the central atom. Okay? That's 26. Is everyone happy in this structure? Yeah. Everyone has an octet of electrons. Okay, so this is good. Nitrogen has eight, fluorine has eight, everyone's super happy. All right, so then there may be the question, well, how do I know when I'm going to make double bonds? All right, so for example, I'm going to use CO2 as a good way to illustrate when you would actually come into a situation uh, when you need to make multiple bonds. So we're going to do the same exact thing for CO2. Okay, so CO2, carbon, how many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. How many valence electrons does oxygen have? 
6, and there are two of them, so that's going to give us 12 electrons total. That gives me 16 electrons to distribute, okay? When I draw my skeletal structure for this, who goes in the middle? Carbon, right? Usually, again, the least electronegative element will come first in the chemical structure. So carbon's going to go in the middle, and I'm going to surround it with the two oxygens because those guys are terminal. What do I do now? So I've summed up my valence electrons. I've drawn the skeletal structure. What's next? Single bonds, right? So I'm going to make single bonds connecting terminal to central. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to fill the outer octets, right? So I go in, I do that, I do that, I do that. Oxygen, they're good. They have eight electrons. How many electrons have I gotten rid of at this point in time? 16. How many did I have to get rid of? 16, right? What's the problem with this structure right now? Carbon doesn't have an octet, right? So when do you need to make double bonds? When do you need to make triple bonds? When you have filled in the outer octets and your central atom, you've gotten rid of all of your electrons and your central atom does not have an octet, okay? At that point in time, you'll take your little eraser and what will you do? You're gonna go in, you're gonna take one of these lone pairs that's on the terminal atom and you're gonna make a double bond with it. So for this little oxygen that's over here that I've just taken the lone pair of electrons from, how many electrons does it still have around it? Eight, right? How many does carbon now have? Six. Just six. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna do the same thing on this side, take a lone pair, make a double bond. All right? That's when you make double bonds. That's when you make triple bonds, yes? It doesn't matter which lone pair you take, right? So we'll talk about that in a second. That's a good point. I could have gone ahead and taken, let's reverse this, reverse this guy. I could have gone ahead and taken this one and make it a double bond, okay? In theory, right now, with what I've introduced you, there is nothing wrong with that structure, right? But just trust me on this one. We'll come into the reason why this is not the correct structure for CO2 in a few slides. Darn it, give me my... Big, I want my big eraser. Okay. Okay, double bond. Yes. Step two. Okay. So step two is the actual number step two? Uh, yes. yes. Okay, so that's when you make double bonds. Okay, when you have distributed everything. You've given the terminal atoms octets, but that central atom does not have an octet. So one more thing, one more little thing I want to go over, and then I will let you guys make as many Lewis structures as you want. What if we have an ion? What if we have something like a polyatomic ion, something like carbonate? How is that going to affect how we actually go about drawing this Lewis structure? Yes? You have to take into account the number of overall balance electrons for the elements themselves plus its Okay, good, yes. So the only way that this is going to differ is when we sum our valence electrons, we're going to take into account the atoms themselves. So carbon has four electrons. Each oxygen for carbonate has six. So three times six, bad six. What is that? 18. What is four plus 18? 22. And then now, to take into account the overall charge of the molecule, what am I going to do? Am I going to add electrons or am I going to subtract electrons from my total electron total? I'm going to add them. And I'm going to add the actual charge. So how many electrons should I add for carbonate? Two. Two more, right? So when I sum my valence electrons, that's when the charge comes in. So this is going to give me 24 overall valence electrons. Okay, so we'll leave this at this one. Just note, if it is a charge, you need to add in or subtract in, and then I will actually go through the drawing of this one in a second. Okay, so go ahead. Let's try some. I want you guys to draw the Lewis structures for carbon tetrachloride, H2S, and then nitrite. I want you to ignore this one, it's bad. Don't want to go there yet. 
So you're going to draw these Lewis structures in Socrative. There's no way for you to draw the Lewis structure in Socrative, but what I do ask is how many lone pairs are on the central atom when you actually draw the correct structure. So draw them, and then the question I ask is a little bit different. Okay, so go ahead and get your answers in if you haven't. We'll go ahead and start going over these. So for carbon tetrachloride, how many total valence electrons were there? So carbon has four. How many does each chlorine have? Seven. So what is the total number of valence electrons that we have to get rid of? 32. All right, so when we do that, who goes in the middle whenever I draw the skeletal structure? Carbon. Carbon is least electronegative. Chlorine, chlorine, chlorine. Make single bonds. Fill in the outer octets. When I do that, how many do I get rid of for electrons? 32, right? So there's no more electrons to put on carbon. So then how many lone pairs does carbon have? Zero, okay? Okay, so we're skipping SO2. What about H2S? How many valence electrons does this molecule have? So we get two times one for the hydrogens, plus how many does sulfur have? Six, so we get eight total. So who goes in the middle? This is kind of a tricky one. I probably should have mentioned it earlier. Sulfur does, even though it comes last. One thing to note, hydrogen can never be a central atom. It always has to be terminal. So regardless of if it's written first, Hydrogen is always terminal. So we go ahead, connect our little central to our little hydrogens, which are terminal. That's four electrons. And then we have two more to get rid of, or four more to get rid of. They go as lone pairs on the central atom. Total eight electrons. How many lone pairs does sulfur have? Two lone pairs of electrons, okay? So then last, we have NO2 minus. So NO2 minus. Who is going to be my central atom? Nitrogen, surrounded by these oxygens. How many total electrons do I have? I have five plus two times six. And then what else do I need to add in? Another one for the negative charge here. So this is going to be plus a one. What is that? 18? Yes. Okay, so I go ahead and make my little single bonds, and then I fill in a little outer octet. Everything's going great. How many electrons have I gotten rid of at this point? 16. So then what do I do? I have left over two more electrons. Where do I put them? Put them. I've been in Oklahoma too much. I put them as a lone pair on the central atom, right? Is this the correct skeletal structure? Am I done quite yet with this one? So I've gotten rid of all of my electrons, so that's great. What's the problem with nitrogen right now, though? It doesn't have an octet, right? So for the correct skeletal structure, I mean the correct Lewis structure, which is what we're talking about, what do I need to do to give nitrogen an octet? I'm going to take, take this guy away, and I'm going to make a double bond. So this would be the correct Lewis structure for NO2. Also note that when we are dealing with these polyatomic ions, to denote the charge on the ion, we'll use brackets and we'll put the charge on the outside. So NO2 minus has a one minus charge. We denote that in the Lewis structure with the brackets and the charge on the outside. Okay, so a couple more things before we finish for today. So I told you at the very beginning that Lewis theory was great because it's super accessible, right? It's super easy to draw these Lewis structures. The problem with it was, though, is that it wasn't actually that good at explaining things. Okay, so there are a couple of exceptions that we're going to have to consider when dealing with drawing Lewis structures. The first one is the fact that while we've said everything wants an octet of electrons, some things actually are okay with less than an octet of electrons. And so those some things, those some atoms, specifically, are beryllium and boron. Okay, so if you have a compound where beryllium is the central atom, beryllium is actually happy with only two bonds to it and four total electrons around it. It does not need to have an octet. This is one of these exceptions that you just have to kind of remember. 
Same thing with respect to beryllium. Nope, boron. Did I say beryllium originally? Beryllium likes two bonds. Boron only needs to have three bonds. So if it's okay with only three bonds around it, how many electrons is it okay with? Six, right? So boron is okay with six electrons. Everything else though in period two has to have eight. Beware number two, exception to the octet rule number two. Sometimes, especially when we deal with nitrogen containing compounds, we will end up with an odd number of electrons. Okay, so that is okay, it's all right. Um, again, these tend to be compounds that contain nitrogen and nitrogen tends to have only seven electrons around it when we actually draw the correct Lewis structure. Okay, so sometimes this will occur. These are what are called uh, radicals. So it doesn't have a paired electron. They're unstable and they tend to decompose, but they will be present every once in a while. Okay, and then exception number three, which is really important to know. Okay, so sometimes you'll be dealing with Lewis structures where the central atom can actually obtain more than eight electrons. Okay, so this is gonna be anything in period three and below. Okay, so we think about this, it kind of makes sense. When we are dealing with everything in period two, which is n equal to two, what are the orbitals that we are allowed to access in period two? Period two has, for valence electrons, has the 2s. And how many electrons can go into the 2s orbital? Two. And then what else does it have? We have the three 2ps, right? So three 2p orbitals, two electrons in each one. How many total electrons can the p's hold? Six. So in n equal to two, six electrons or eight electrons, that's all we can have, right? What happens when we go into period three where our principal quantum number is equal to three? For valence in this shell, well, we won't even deal with valence, but what is, with respect to orbitals, what do we introduce when we get to n equal to three? We introduce the d orbitals, right? And so because of that, the d orbitals give us the ability to make more bonds or have more electrons than just eight so that anything in period three and below can have more than eight electrons around it. This could be 10 electrons, it could be 12 electrons, et cetera, okay? Okay, so how would we actually go about dealing with something like this? So we can draw the Lewis structure for sulfur tetrafluoride to kind of illustrate this. So in drawing this Lewis structure, what is my first step in doing this? First step is what? My little rules, four easy steps to drawing Lewis structures. Skeletal structure, that's usually where it starts. But you can also count the valence electrons first if you want to too. So skeletal structure, who's gonna be my central atom here? Sulfur. Sulfur is gonna be surrounded by our four fluorines, which are terminal. Then we're gonna count our valence electrons. So how many valence electrons does sulfur have? Six, so let me move this guy over, six electrons. And then how many valence electrons does fluorine have? Seven, there are four of them. So overall that's 28, six plus 28, is that right? Yes, it's 34. 34 electrons to get rid of into this structure. So then do my same exact thing. I make my little single bonds, single bonds. And then what do I do? Fill in the outer octets. So I go two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, six, 28, 30, 32. So I've gotten rid of 32 electrons. How many did I have to get rid of originally? 34, so now what do I do? I'm gonna add a lone pair to sulfur. So I'm gonna pick a little quarter. I'm gonna add the lone pair together. They don't get separated. That's okay though. How many electrons does sulfur have around it at this point? 10, it's fine. Where's sulfur at? Period three, all right? You look across, look at the row it's in. It's in row three, that's okay because sulfur has D orbitals so we can make more bonds. It doesn't just get stuck with eight electrons. Okay, so we'll go ahead and try that. We've got two structures. 
And I want you guys to tell me when you draw the correct Lewis structures for these two, how many lone pairs of electrons do you have on the central atom? Okay, so we'll go ahead and go over these. Most of you guys got these correct. We're at about a 71% and a 77% correct rate. Okay, so with respect to these, um, xenon dichloride. So our xenon is gonna be our central atom. What's great to note about xenon with respect to where it's at on the periodic table it is in period three and below, right? So that means what? You can have an expanded octet, so more than eight electrons. So when we go ahead and sum up the valence electrons for these guys, how many does xenon give us? Eight. Xenon is a noble gas, it gives us eight. And then both of the chlorines give us seven, that's 14, 14 plus eight is 22. So we make single bond, single bond, dot, 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 dot. That gets rid of 16, what do I do with the rest of the six? that I have left? Just a lone pair on xenon. And so just by convention, we try to pick a corner and put the pairs together. So then how many lone pairs does xenon give a, or have right now? Three total lone pairs. Three lone pairs. Okay, so then I have five. We've got iodine, which gives us seven, and then fluorine, which gives us 35. So 35 plus seven is 42. Lots of electrons. So iodine comes in the center. We get uh, fluorine, 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 fluorine. Single bond, single bond, single bond. Fill in the outer octets. How many electrons do I get rid of when I fill in the outer octets? 40. So 40 gets rid of those guys. Everything on the outside is happy. What do I do with that last two electrons? They're just going to go as a lone pair on my iodine. So that means for iodine in this structure, how many total electrons does it have around it? 12, which is okay. It's fine. It's because it's in period three and below. It can expand its octet. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I want to make a note about something though, right? So with respect to Lewis structures, this kind of forms the basis behind what we do next chapter two. So if you cannot correctly draw Lewis structures, you're not gonna be able to correctly identify the molecular geometry. You can always Google it, right? But you can't Google it on an exam. Or you can try to Google it on an exam and then hopefully I could catch you, okay? So just note that, right? You need to be able to do this on your own. Okay, so with respect to exam, Okay, so um, for some of our Lewis structures, they're fairly um, simple and easy to draw, um, but we're going to find with some compounds that one Lewis structure by itself is not going to be an adequate way to describe bonding, right? Um, and so in these cases, we're going to invoke this, this concept of resonance or resonance structures, um, and I'm going to try to explain what I mean by resonance and resonance structures using um, the example of ozone, right? So ozone has a molecular formula of O3. If I went about drawing the Lewis structure for this, I would follow my same um, rules as before, right? So the first thing I would do would be to um, draw the skeletal structure. I have three oxygens, so there's really no um, other way to arrange them besides having an oxygen, an oxygen, and an oxygen. Let me, I like drawing that better, maybe a little bigger. Oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. 
Um, after drawing the skeletal structure, I'm going to sum up the valence electrons. We have three oxygens, so that's three times six valence electrons, which gives me 18 valence electrons. So now I'm going to start to distribute them. I'm going to first do that by drawing uh, single bonds. And again, I've drawn the structure terribly. I want these guys closer. So first I'm going to start by drawing single bonds between my central atom and my terminal atoms. Then I'm going to fill in the terminal atoms octets. So we have 2, 4, 6, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So the terminals are filled in with 8 electrons. I still have 2 more to get rid of because I had 18 to get rid of initially. So those are going to go as a lone pair on the central atom. Okay, so at this point in time, um, we're not quite there. We're not quite done with drawing the resonance or drawing the... Uh, Lewis structure for this because at this point we have a central atom here that does not have an octet of electrons, right? It only has six around it. So the way that we fix that issue is we're going to take a lone pair from one of these terminal atoms, right? So we'll take this guy, for example, and we're going to make a double bond with it. So we'll make a double bond between our central atom and our terminal atom, right? And so now everything with respect to our rules of Lewis structures is satisfied, right? We've got eight electrons around um, every atom and we've got a complete structure. Now, okay, so big deal. This is again, what we've gone over already, how to draw Lewis structures. Um, with respect to resonance structures, you may question why necessarily I picked to take electrons from this oxygen um, and make the double bond as opposed to instead have taking electrons from this oxygen, right? And the question could be, well, do they differ? And the answer is yes, right? So if we said we had oxygen one, oxygen two, oxygen three, another way that we could draw this would have been taking those uh, lone pairs of electrons, forming that double bond with the electrons from this oxygen, right? So another way that we could have drawn this would have had a double bond between oxygen one and oxygen two a single bond between oxygen two, 2 and 3, and then we would have had uh, six uh, lone electrons around this guy, and then we would have had uh, two lone pairs of electrons around this guy, right? Now, these are different structures, and I want to try to get that across. But the question would now be, well, which one is the correct one, right? And this is where we invoke this idea of resonance and resonance structures, okay? The answer to which one is the correct one is actually neither of them are correct. The actual correct structure is what we're going to call a hybridization of these two structures, right? And this kind of comes back to this fact that Lewis theory is an incomplete theory. It's very easy to use, right? And we can draw all these great uh, structures for whatever compound we want, but it's not adequate necessarily in explaining bonding in all of the various structures, right? And so a way we can get around that is we can still draw these Lewis structures, but then we also have to invoke this idea of resonance, okay? Now, what do we mean necessarily by resonance, okay? The real actual structure of ozone is best represented as a hybridization, and I'm going to try to explain what I mean by hybridization, of these two resonance structures, right? So these are both what we would call resonance structures. Again, they only differ, and if you'll notice, in the placement of this double bond, right? So this double bond is either between oxygen two and oxygen three, or this double bond is in between oxygen one and oxygen two, right? So the only way that these guys differ is just arrangement of electrons in a structure. We don't actually change the overall structure itself. We just change where the electrons are necessarily at. Oh, and let me go ahead and finish this. People will be upset. What happened to those lone electrons? Okay, there they are. Right, so these are both resonant structures. Again, they only differ in the placement of electrons. And the reality of the real structure is going to be taking these resonance structures and drawing what we call a resonance hybrid. In the resonance hybrid, what we're doing is we're kind of averaging the, the different resonance structures together to get an overall um, picture of what the real molecule looks like, right? So I'm going to go ahead and redraw the oxygen, oxygen, oxygen the reality or the resonance hybrid of this guy is not necessarily that that um let's say that this bond is necessarily a single bond and this is a double bond or this is a double and this is a single the reality is these are both going to be essentially a bond in a half 
right? It's kind of like taking the two, it's melding them together. And at the end of the day, what we're going to end up with is two equivalent bonds that essentially have a bond and a half worth of electrons. So this would be the resonance hybrid. And this would be kind of like our idea behind the real overall structure of ozone. Okay, so anytime we deal with resonance structures, like again, these multiple structures that are trying to depict our overall structure, um, we always utilize uh, these, these guys, so these brackets, right, to kind of bracket our structures. And then this arrow right here is supposed to be our resonance arrow. It's not important that you guys know that, but just note. Um, and then one other thing to note is that there are two different types of electrons depending on in our overall resonance structures where they're at. Um, so if we had, let's just say, a normal Lewis structure, and let's say it was something like HF, right? So hydrofluoric acid. These electrons, um, there's no other way that we can draw the structure, right? They are going to be between hydrogen and fluorine, right? So we call these electrons um, localized. They exist between hydrogen and fluorine. That's where they're at. There's no question about that. Um, but these electrons that are over here, right? So let's say um, these electrons in this, this double bond that kind of move between two different places. Again, I shouldn't say move between, but are located in those two resonance structures over two different locations. These are what we call delocalized. Um, and what we'll find as you move into organic chemistry is that this delocalization of electrons is actually energetically very favorable, right? So um, um, if, a, if a molecule has multiple resonance structures and it has multiple delocalized electrons, those molecules tend to be a lot more stable than things where we have um, localized electrons. And again, that kind of goes into the purview of organic chemistry, which uh, we don't necessarily need to talk about right here, okay? All right, so... A couple other things. Um, again, with respect to resonance structures, um, kind of some key takeaways is that if you're drawing multiple resonance structures for a compound, um, the only thing that can change for them to be valid resonance structures is the position of the electrons in the compound, right? So for example, if I was drawing resonance structures for nitrate, so down here we have nitrate, we've got nitrogen, uh, oxygen, 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 um, and in these structures, the only way they're going to differ is by the placement of that double bond, right? So either the double bonds between this nitrogen and this oxygen, it's either between these guys or it's between these guys, right? There's three different ways that we can draw that exact same structure. The reality, again, the resonance hybrid for this is going to be essentially a bond and what we'd call a third between all three oxygens and the nitrogen, right? It's gonna, again gonna be kind of like a, an averaging of the three different structures. Um, but a non-valid resonance structure that wouldn't count overall in this is if we tried to change the arrangement of the atoms themselves, right? So I could have also drawn an oxygen um, with an oxygen with an oxygen with a nitrogen. This is not a valid resonance structure. The only thing that we're changing is we're taking that central structure and we're just changing the positions of electrons um, throughout the structure, right? So this resonance does not count when you move the atoms themselves. It only counts when you're moving electrons. Okay, and so um, I'll go ahead and run through an example. We've kind of already hit this a little bit, but I'll do this example and then we'll move on from this. Um, so this is asking me to draw Resonance structures for uh, CO3, so carbonate. We can go ahead, carbonate. Um, and in problems like this, it'll probably be like, oh, how many different resonance structures can you draw for something, right? So I'm still gonna follow my exact same rules as drawing Lewis structures. I'm gonna start, start by drawing my um, skeletal structure. Again, the thing, the central atom usually is the thing listed first in the overall uh, formula. So I'm gonna have carbon, right? it's going to be surrounded by three oxygens. So we have an oxygen, we have an oxygen, we have an oxygen. Um, and then I'm going to sum up my valence electrons, right? So I've got carbon, which is four valence electrons. I've got three times oxygen, which is three times six. And then we have a minus two charge, so we have to add in uh, two more electrons because of that. So we have 20, 24, so 24 valence electrons. 
We're now going to go ahead and distribute. So again, I'm going to make a single bond between my terminal atom and my um, central atom for each one. So single bond, single bond, single bond. I'm then going to fill in my outer octets. So we've got uh, two already for that oxygen. We need six more in the form of lone pairs. Same thing here. Same thing here. So now we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Okay, so I have distributed all my valence electrons. They're gone. Um, I have uh, octets for all of my uh, terminal atoms, but the problem with this structure at this point is that carbon does not have an octet, right? And so this is when you're going to tend to find resonance is when you have lone pairs on things and you're going to need a double bond. There's going to be a, a multiple bond, a double or a triple bond. Right. So the question is, well, who do I take this from? I'm going to need to take uh, a lone pair and I'm going to make, make a double bond with it. But I have a couple of different options, right? Right here, I could form it between oxygen one and carbon. I could have also, in an equivalent manner, formed between oxygen two and carbon, right? So another way that we could have drawn this. So this is, we'll say this is structure number one. Another way that we could have drawn it, though, is, and let me just go ahead and do that again. Oops, nope, don't want that. Do that one more time, because surprisingly, there'll be three of these guys. Um, so another way that we could have drawn that is by taking a lone pair here. Oops, I don't want to do that one. Mm. Forward, okay, sorry. My bad. Um, is by taking a lone pair here, or taking this lone pair and making a double bond, right? So then that would have given back this guy. So now I'd have the double bond between carbon and oxygen too. Or a third way to do, have done that would have been on the other side by taking the lone pair here and making the double bond. And then let's get rid of this guy and put a lone pair back on this oxygen, right? So all of these structures are different, right? They have um, those electrons forming the double bond in between different oxygens and carbons, right? We have carbon one in the first structure or oxygen one in the first structure. The double bond is between oxygen two and carbon in the second structure. The double bond is between oxygen three and carbon in the third structure. We could call this structure A, we could call this structure B, we could call this structure C. Um, and again, the kind of question of which one is the accurate, accurate structure for this is not really a valid one. It's the accurate structure is really an averaging of all three, right? So if we wanted to draw that, again, it'd be very similar to nitrate, where we'd have carbon, and then between all these carbon-oxygen bonds, we'd have a bond in a third. And this would be what we would consider the resonance hybrid for this overall height structure. But these would be the three different resonance structures for this compound. Okay, so again, what you're looking for a lot of times with this is the presence of lone pairs, right? Lone pairs and the presence of a double bond. If you have a structure that has lone pairs and the presence of a double bond or a triple bond, you will likely have uh, multiple different ways that you can draw that. Okay, so a couple of other things to note about this. Um, with our carbonate and our nitrate and our ozone, um, all of the structures that we were drawing were equivalent to one another, right? They only differed in the fact that a double bond was between one oxygen and carbon or another oxygen and carbon, etc. right? They were all um, equally valid structures, okay? Now, sometimes you're going to be able to draw resonance structures um, where one of them actually may be a better structure than the other, right? So, for example, one of my early um, examples of why you need to make double bonds, we had the example of carbon dioxide, Right, so whenever we drew the structure of carbon dioxide, we ended up 
um, let's go ahead and draw that in our original structure where we had a single bond, a single bond, and then we had the two oxygens with their fill octets. The problem with this, of course, was the fact that the central carbon didn't have an octet. So we took um, a lone pair from one of the terminal atoms and we made a double bond. And then we equivalently took a lone pair from the other atom, other oxygen, and made a double bond. And that gave our central atom its octet, right? Now, we didn't necessarily have to do that, right? We could have also had said, okay, well, we've got carbon, we've got oxygen, we've got oxygen, we'll fill in these guys. And instead of, so we'll go ahead and do the same thing, we still need to make an octet. But what if instead of going over here to this oxygen, what if I just took this guy away again, right? What if I said, okay, I'm just going to take another one and I'm going to make a triple bond because we know that triple bonds do exist, right? Like that can, that can happen. Okay. Again, this is not a valid structure. This does not violate any rules with respect to Lewis theory, right? This oxygen has eight electrons. This oxygen has eight electrons. This carbon has eight electrons. So everything is happy in terms of our rules with respect to Lewis theory, right? So now the question is, well, these again are resonance structures of one another, right? All they differ is in the presence of or the placement of electrons in this overall structure. And again, they dealt with the movement of a lone pair into making a double bond, right? And so both of these structures are essentially resonance structures for CO2, okay? Now, the question is, well, which one is more valid or is there more one that's more valid, right? Are these equivalent? Will we have like a, a, a double bond and a half and then a single bond and a half, right? Or like which one, is there a better structure overall, okay? And the answer to that is there is. One of these structures is actually better and will contribute more to the resonance hybrid than the other. But the question is, well, how do we know that? Right. And so to figure out or to differentiate between competing resonance structures, we use something called formal charge. Right. And so formal charge is going to look like a charge. Right. You're going to think it's like a charge, like a minus one charge or a minus two charge. But in reality, it's just a bookkeeping method for us to keep track of electrons in a structure. OK. Um, we've actually talked about another bookkeeping method before. So redox oxidation states, those were also bookkeeping methods. Um, this is going to be a little bit different though, okay? So with respect to formal charge, what we're doing is we're looking at each individual atom on its own, and we're trying to define uh, two different things, right? So in this structure, this atom, how many electrons does it want? And then how many electrons have we actually given to it in this overall structure, okay? So um, let's say for oxygen, the whole how many electrons does it want is the number of valence electrons, and then how many do we give it in, an, in a structure? Um, so in a structure, we're going to imagine that all the bonds are split evenly, right? So for example, if I go in here um, and I split this double bond right in half, we're essentially going to give half of these guys to oxygen and half of them to uh, carbon, right? So in a double bond, in a double bond, there are four electrons. For oxygen, I'm going to give one half of it. So one half of four is two. But then I'm also going to account for the fact that these lone pair lie solely on oxygen. So anytime you have a lone pair, you're going to assign all of those electrons to that atom specifically. Okay. So uh, for oxygen, it's again going to be the number of valence electrons, the number of electrons that it wants, which is six electrons. And then in this structure, we're going to subtract from that all of the electrons that we have assigned to it, right? So we have two from the double bond, and then two, four, six, uh, the two lone pairs. So we have uh, four lone electrons plus two from the bond, which gives us six electrons. And so we have what is called a zero formal charge overall, okay? Now, you can think of it like that, right? How many valence or how many electrons does it want versus how many have we assigned? You can also utilize this formula, right? Where when we're looking at the formal charge or something, it's the number of valence electrons. Again, how many does it want? Minus all of the lone electrons, right? So again, we counted 
two, four, six for that oxygen, and then half of the bonding electrons. Because again, in these bonds, we're giving one half to one atom, one half to the other. For this guy, um, this was one half of four electrons, and this guy overall was four electrons, this guy was six. So we do six minus four plus one half of four, that's six minus six, which is zero. Okay, so we could do the same thing for this oxygen, but note that its electronic environment is exactly the same, right? It's going to have the same uh, number of valence electrons, so we'll call this guy oxygen 2. Um, it's going to have the same 6 valence electrons minus we have 2, 4 lone pairs, so 4 lone electrons plus 1 half of a double bond, 1 half of 4. So this is also going to have a formal charge of zero. So we can just write zero formal charge, zero formal charge. Okay, same thing for carbon. Let's say we do carbon. Carbon's got, um, wants four electrons. That's how many valence electrons it is. Minus, carbon doesn't have any lone electrons around it. All it has is the bonding electrons. And again, in these bonds, we're going to say half of them go to this guy half of them go to the other guy, All right? So we have one half of two, four, six, eight. So we've got four minus four, we have a zero formal charge overall. So that's easy, right? What's the point of this, okay? Over here though, what we're gonna find is we're gonna find some differences, right? So carbon, if you calculate the formal charge, is still gonna be zero. But now we'll call this oxygen one, this oxygen two. For this structure, oxygen one has a formal charge equal to six electrons, that's the valence electrons, minus, it only has two in terms of lone pairs, right? It's only got two lone electrons here. And we're gonna take half of that triple bond, which a triple bond has six electrons in it, right? So here we'll have six minus two plus three, which is an overall positive one formal charge. We have a positive one here. And then if we calculated oxygen two, we still have six minus, now we have two, four, six lone electrons. So six plus one half of a single bond. So one half of two electrons. This is gonna give us six minus seven, which gives us a minus one formal charge overall, okay? So now, again, we have two competing resonance structures, right? And the question is, is are both of these valid? And are they going to contribute equally to the overall resonance hybrid? The answer to that is no, right? If you do have competing structures, the best structure is going to be the one with the least formal charges, right? And so if we compare the two right now, this guy, all of the charges were zero, right? Whereas this guy, we had a positive one and we had a minus one, okay? So... This one, just by that rule alone, is the better structure overall. It's going to contribute more to the actual resonance hybrid. Um, but sometimes we'll find in some of these structures that we will have to have formal charge. And so then there are a couple of other rules um, for if you do have formal charge involved, um, again, which structure is going to be the best, okay? So um, again, number one, Ideally, the best structure is going to have the least formal charge, so if everything is zero, then that's ideal. Um, number two, though, if you do have formal charge in a structure, um, you want to put the negative one on what's called the most electronegative atom. And unfortunately, I know I haven't defined electronegativity yet. We're getting to that in a second. Um, but just for right now, think, uh, think of the most electronegative atom as the element farthest to the right in the periodic table. Um, another thing to note is that if you do have charge, you really don't want to go past a minus one or a plus one. A minus two and a plus two tend to not really contribute much overall at, at all, so those structures aren't really that valid. Um, but then another thing to note too is that when you sum up all of the formal charges of um, an overall structure, they all have to sum to the charge on the overall structure, right? So for example, um, in our CO, in our CO2 example from that previous slide, we had a structure here where we had a zero, a zero, a zero. These guys all sum to the overall charge of CO2, which is zero. Even when we had this guy, 
right, where we had a minus 1, a 0, a plus 1, these still all sum to 0, which again matches the overall charge of the molecule. So that's kind of an overall rule. When you um, sum up all the formal charges in your structure, they all still have to sum to the overall charge of the molecule. So for example, I have one down here where we have um, this thiocyanate, right? So we have NCS. Um, and we have three different competing resonance structures, right? So we have A, we have B, and we have C. And we're trying to figure out, well, which one is the best structure? Which one is contributing more overall to the resonance hybrid? And so we've calculated up top the formal charge of each of these using um, that little formula from before for each of these various atoms. Um, and so now we're trying to figure out, okay, using these rules up here, um, which one is the best structure, okay? Again, the first rule is... Um, we want to have those those formal charges as close to zero as possible. And so because of that, since this one has a minus 2 and a plus 1, um, those are the largest charges overall. So this is probably the worst structure because of that minus 2, whereas these guys only have a minus 1, a 0, 0, and a minus 1, 0, 0 over here, right? So we want to minimize charge as much as possible because of that A is the worst structure because it has a minus 2. Um, but then between B and C, the only way they differ is who the negative charge is on. We have a minus on the nitrogen here, whereas the minus one is on the sulfur here. And so now that brings into account, if we do have a negative formal charge, we need it on the most electronegative atom. When we deal with electronegativity, we're going to find out that sulfur is more electronegative than nitrogen. And so because of that, C is the best and it's going to contribute the most, and then this guy is kind of like the middle. It's going to contribute in between A and in between C, okay? And again, you may be, I may be questioning why I'm saying contribute. Um, again, the overall structure is given by the residence hybrid of the three, but when we hybridize those or when we average those, the best structure um, is going to like contribute 90% to the overall structure, whereas like a, a little structure will be like, I don't know, maybe like, nine percent right and then the worst structure only contributes like one percent right so the hybrid um, when you have these various resonance structures that aren't necessarily equivalent um, is going to be contributed the most from the, the best structure overall um, then less from the the lesser two structures so if again if the best structure is c and c looks like this then the resonance hybrid pretty much looks like that as well it's only going to have like 10 percent from the other two structures and these percentages are just stuff that I've made up, so please don't take any um, thing away from that. And the fact that you don't have to you don't have to come up with those percentages at all. Okay, so go ahead and try this question. So we have this cyanate ion, um, and they give you the the formula for this. This is also kind of hinting at the overall structure. Um, so when we draw the skeletal structure for this, we're going to have nitrogen um, on one side of the carbon and oxygen on the other. Again, there are going to be uh, multiple resonance structures for this. So the first step is drawing the resonance structures. And then in the second step, you're going to calculate the formal charge of each atom in each structure to determine which of the various structures is the best. So go ahead, take some time with this, and then come back and get the answer. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, go over this one. So again, the first step in this is drawing the Lewis structure, right? And hopefully, once you draw the Lewis structure, you can kind of see where some of these uh, resonance structures are going to come from. I will note that these resonance structures are not going to be equivalent to one another, like we found for carbonate or nitrate. Um, so again, the first step in drawing Lewis structure is writing the skeletal structure. We've already done that. The next step is summing the valence electrons. So valence, electrons, we've got an oxygen. An oxygen gives us six valence electrons. We've got a carbon, that's got four valence electrons. Um, and we've got a nitrogen, which is five valence electrons. But then overall, there is a minus one charge here, right? This is O, C, N minus. So we have 15 from the atoms themselves. We're going to add in one more for that negative charge, which gives us 16 valence electrons overall. All right, so then next step after we sum up the valence electrons is distributing. 
We're again going to first start by making single bonds between our central atom and our terminal atoms. Um, and then we're going to fill in the outer octets of the terminal atoms. So we've got two, four, six, eight for oxygen. We've got two, four, six, eight for nitrogen. Um, that is it. That's the 16 electrons that we had. Um, so now there's a problem with this structure, and that's the fact that carbon doesn't have an octet. So to alleviate that, I'm going to take one of these guys. I'm going to make a double bond. And I'm also going to take one from the other side and make a double bond, similar to what we've done for CO2. Okay. Now, this is one uh, resonance structure. If I go ahead and hopefully don't mess up, copy-paste other structures. There were a couple of different ways that we could have actually achieved that. And again, this kind of goes back to what we saw for uh, CO2. Oh no. Okay. Well, I'm going to pause for a second. Right. So if we go back to this step. I think my iPad is getting slow. And we redraw what we had before we made those double bonds. Um, one way that we could have also done this is instead of going to nitrogen at all, so we're just going to ignore nitrogen, we could have taken, let me just zoom over, uh, a lone pair from the oxygen, made a double bond, which we've already done, but we could have also taken another lone pair from that oxygen and made a double bond. And again, this would have given us a valid structure, all right? There, we're not breaking any rules of resonance or um, any rules of Lewis structures, right? The other way that we could have gone about doing this is we could have taken everything from nitrogen instead. So we could have said, okay, we're going to leave oxygen alone. It's going to leave, be left with its uh, six lone electrons. And instead, we're going to take everything from nitrogen. So again, if we go back to where we were, we're going to take uh, one of these guys make a double bond. We're going to take another and make a another bond, so triple bond. So we have one, two, three, four. And that is another valid structure. OK, so all of these are valid structures. So all of these are resonance structures for the cyanate ion. The question now is, is there a better structure overall? Right, so we'll call this structure A. We'll call this structure B. And then we'll call this structure C. We're going to answer that by calculating the formal charges and using those rules with respect to formal charges to figure out which is the best structure. Okay, so I'll start with the carbon in structure A, but I'm only going to note this, that carbon is going to be the same regardless for all the structures. So the formal charge of carbon here is number of valence electrons for carbon, which was four. And then I'm going to subtract from that all of the electrons that are assigned to carbon in the structure. There are no lone pairs of electrons, so this is zero lone electrons. But we do have bonding electrons around it. Specifically, we've got two, four, six, eight. But again, we're only going to give it half of that. So one half of eight is four. So four minus four gives us a zero formal charge, right? And we will note that carbon doesn't change throughout the structures. It either has um, eight electrons around it in the form of a triple bond and a single bond, or two double bonds, or a triple bond and a single bond, right? So we only have to do that really once. Okay, so then I'm going to go ahead and calculate, I'm going to call this oxygen one. I'm going to go ahead and calculate the formal charge here. Um, so formal charge for oxygen one is equal to number of valence electrons, which is six, minus now we do give uh, lone pairs here, so there's only two of them. So two lone electrons plus one half of the bonding electrons. This is a triple bond, so there are six electrons in it. We're gonna give half of them to the oxygen. So we end up with six minus uh, five, which gives us a positive one formal charge. And then if we do this for nitrogen, for nitrogen, mm, formal charge, we'll call this nitrogen one. Uh, we're gonna get five valence electrons minus, right now this guy has two, four, six lone electrons minus one half of 
there's only one bond, so one half of two. So this gives me a five minus seven, which gives me a minus two overall. Yeah, yep, mm -hmm. okay, so that's minus two. All right, so now, if we go through and we do the same thing for B, what we're gonna find for B is that oxygen has a zero here. It already had a zero for carbon, right? And then we calculate the formal charge for nitrogen here. This is actually gonna have a formal charge of a minus one. Again, if we sum all of these up, we had a plus one, we had a zero, we had a minus two. This equals minus one. We have a zero, we have a zero and a minus one. This also equals minus one, which is the charge overall in this molecule. If we then do the same thing for C, we'll find that we have a minus one in the oxygen, we have a zero, and we have a zero. Okay, again, they all sum to minus one. So these are all valid structures. Now, the question is which one is the best? So A was bad, right? A had a minus two on a nitrogen, a plus one on an oxygen. Number one, between nitrogen and oxygen, oxygen is more electronegative, so we want the negative on it. This one had a positive on it, and it had a minus two charge, so that's not good. So this guy, because of the magnitude of this, is the worst. And then between B and C, they only differ in where that negative lies. So the negative lies on nitrogen in B, and the negative lies on oxygen in C. Right. So there's no magnitude issues here. It's just where do we want to put that negative. I've already said that oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, so we want to put the negative on it, and that's what we have in C. So C is the best. This is the best structure. It will contribute more overall to the resonance hybrid. Um, this is the, the medium or the middle, and this guy is the worst. And the question here is what is the formal charge of oxygen in the best structure? That formal charge is equal to minus 1. Okay, so again, I kind of skipped over like calculating the formal charge for everyone. Just note that there are patterns to this, right? So note that if you had oxygen with only a lone pair, one lone pair, and a triple bond or three bonds, this had a positive one. Oxygen with two lone pairs and two bonds had a zero. And then oxygen with three lone pairs and a bond had a minus one. That's always going to be the case. If oxygen has two lone pairs, in two bonds, it's always going to have a zero formal charge. If it has three lone pairs and a single bond, it's always going to have a minus one formal charge, right? So you can kind of get a hang of some of these as you um, get more practice with them. Okay, so um, we just got finished talking about one limitation with respect to Lewis theory, and that has to do with resonance structures, the fact that you can uh, sometimes draw different structures that differ only in the arrangement of electrons in the structure um, and all of those can be valid Lewis structures but one of them or, or two of them um, can actually be structure, structures that contribute to the overall uh, real resonance hybrid right so again this limitation with respect to Lewis theory is the fact that sometimes it doesn't explain bonding all that well um, another limitation with respect to Lewis theory um, is the fact that when we draw electrons and bonds in our Lewis structures, um, those electrons appear to be shared equally between the two atoms, right? So for example, if we had something like hydrogen fluoride, and we drew out the Lewis structure for hydrogen fluoride, we'd have a bunch of lone pairs around fluorine, we'd have a bond between hydrogen and fluorine, right? And when we look at this and we count electrons, etc., or when we do things like formal charge, we look at that bond and we say these electrons are being split evenly between hydrogen and the fluorine, right? And that's what we imagine when we're dealing with covalent bonds, this equal share. Now, that unfortunately is not the case, right? So if you think about fluorine, right, and where fluorine lies on the periodic table, Fluorine tends to like to gain electrons, right? So if it were to form an ionic compound, it usually forms that, that minus one charge because it has this tendency to take electrons from other things. Whereas hydrogen has a tendency to lose electrons, right? It has this tendency to form uh, a plus one charge, right? Um, so now if we were dealing with ionic compounds, we would actually be dealing with these charged particles. 
but we're not. We're actually still dealing with a covalent bond and a sharing of electrons. Um, but this is not an equal sharing, and it has to do with this tendency of fluorine to take electrons and hydrogen to give electrons, right? So what we find here is that instead of this being this complete equal sharing of electrons, we end up with, with what is called a polar covalent bond. So in a polar covalent bond, um, the electrons are still being shared between the two atoms. They're just being shared unequally, right? What we find here is that the majority of the electrons actually hover around fluorine, and only a few little bits of them hover around hydrogen, okay? Okay, so there are a couple different ways that we can represent this polar covalent bond or the degree of this unequal sharing. One way is via what is called partial charges, right? So if we had actually formed a charged molecule, we'd have this full negative, we'd have this full positive. But in this structure, we're not forming charges. Um, but to represent this, this unequal distribution of electrons, what we'll use is what is called a partial charge, which is given by the Greek letter delta. And we'll have a delta minus for the negative, or the, the fluorine, which is withdrawing electron density towards itself, and a delta positive for the thing that's losing that electron density um, going to the other side. All right, so these partial charges, again, this guy is the Greek letter delta. So we have a delta minus and a delta plus. And again, it's representing not a full negative, not a full positive, but again, these partial charges overall. So this guy is our partial charges. Another way that we can represent this polar covalent bond or this unequal sharing of electrons um, is via this little arrow vector notation. And so in this, what we do is we'll represent the atom who has this tendency to lose these electrons um, with our little plus sign here. And we'll have this arrow going to the electron or the atom that tends to take the electrons more towards itself. So another way that we can represent this polarity is again having that plus with the thing that loses the electrons and the arrow going towards the atom that tends to take that electron density towards itself. So two different ways that we can represent um, these polar bonds. Okay, so one question would be, well, how do we know that this is, or how do we know that this exists? So if you take something like HF, um, again, with these partial, um, these partial positive and partial negative bonds, or charges, and you put them in an electric field, you will find that these molecules will orient in terms of those partial negative and partial positives, right? So um, the fluorine will orient itself um, with respect to being attracted to the positive charge or the positive plate of your electric field, whereas the hydrogen will orient itself where it's attracted to or pointed towards the negative charge or the negative plate of that electric field, right? And so we can essentially prove the existence of these partial charges by putting these polar, polar molecules in, um, in an electric field and having them orient with respect to the electric field. Okay, so one question would be, well, how do we know whether or not we're dealing with a polar bond? Um, and so this comes back to what I've been mentioning overall, or a lot, um, which is something called electronegativity. Okay, so electronegativity is essentially the measure or the degree to which an atom in a compound likes to withdraw electron density towards itself unequally, right? So for example, um, if we we're talking about hydrogen fluoride, we would say that fluorine has a greater tendency to withdraw electrons towards itself. So fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. So overall, the more electronegative you are, um, the more you have this tendency to withdraw electron density towards yourself when you are in a bond or when you're forming a bond with something else. Now, what's nice about electronegativity is that it's actually a measurable value. So depending on the book that you're using, it's going to sometimes give you different values. Um, but there is a scale and there are numbers involved with this. Um, we only really use the numbers kind of briefly as we go through the lecture. If I actually have you calculate something, I would give you these values. So please don't feel the need to like memorize this. You will need to memorize, though, kind of the trend with respect to um, electronegativity. So note that up here at the top right is fluorine. 
and fluorine has a value of four. So overall, the larger this value of electronegativity, the more electronegative the element. Um, and so fluorine, compared to everyone else in the periodic table, is the most electronegative element. It has the largest value in this electronegativity scale. Um, so then if we go down here to the bottom, so bottom left, uh, we find francium. And francium, actually, if you compare it to other things, it has the smallest value in terms of electronegativity. So this is the least electronegative element on the periodic table. Okay, so you should notice then if top right is most and bottom left is least and that there is a trend overall in electronegativity. So as we move from left to right, right, so as we move from left to right across the periodic table, we increase overall in electronegativity. So things at the top right are very, very electronegative. Things at the left are not electronegative. Those tend to be metals anyways. And then as we move from top to bottom, we'll find that we decrease overall in electronegativity. So we decrease as we move from top to bottom. So left to right we increase, top to bottom we decrease. You should know the trend overall with respect to electronegativity. Okay, so then what do we actually use these values for, right? So we can define, now that we've defined this idea behind polarity of covalent bonds, we can define essentially four different types of bonds. The first type of bond is going to be a bond that actually has complete equal sharing of electrons, right? This is going to be the type of bond that forms between atoms of itself, right? So for example, chlorine is a good model of that, right? Dichloride. If we have a bond between a chlorine which has an electronegativity of 3 and another chlorine that has an electronegativity of 3, neither of these two differs overall in their ability to withdraw electron density towards themselves. Right. So if we're looking here at the difference in this guy, so the difference in electronegativity, we find this difference is 0, meaning they're equal they both withdraw electron density towards themselves in an equal manner. And so this is what we would refer to as a pure covalent bond. So note, you may say, well, where did you get that 3 from? Again, if you go back and you look on that table in the electronegativity scale, chlorine has a value of 3. So both of them have a value of 3. If we looked at the difference between them, that difference is zero. And this difference in electronegativity is usually how we measure um, this overall general polarity of a bond. Okay, so again, things that are like one another, so hydrogen and hydrogen, this would also be a pure covalent bond. Or anything that has a difference in electronegativity equal to zero would be a pure covalent bond. There'd be equal sharing between the two. Now, another type of bond that we could have is something called a nonpolar covalent. So this is essentially a type of bond that we assume to have equal sharing, even though there is a slight difference in electronegativity, right? A good example of this is something like carbon and hydrogen. If we look up the electronegativity value of carbon, this ends up being a 2.5. If we look up the value for hydrogen, this is a 2.1. So the difference between these two ends up being about a 0.4. So anytime we have a difference and electronegativity between uh, 0 0.1 and the 0 0.4, this is what we refer to as this nonpolar covalent. And you can, I mean, we don't always have to say nonpolar covalent. A lot of times we'll just say nonpolar because we assume it's a covalent bond, um, but technically we call it nonpolar covalent. So we assume that this is essentially. There are no partial charges. There is no unequal distribution of electrons, even though there may be a tiny slight amount. Okay, so then if that's a nonpolar covalent, and again, carbon and hydrogen is a very good example of that, what is going to be um, the required values in these differences of electronegativity is to give us a polar bond, right, where we saw what we saw with hydrogen fluoride. Um, so if we have a difference of electronegativity between two atoms in a bond um, between this 0.5 and 1.9, then that is what we refer to as polar covalent. And again, the larger this difference, the larger 
um, these overall partial charges, the greater this uneven distribution of electrons. So a good example of a polar covalent bond is between carbon and oxygen. So carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5, oxygen is 3.5. So overall, this difference in electronegativity is 1, which again gives us our nice polar covalent bond. And then finally, anything that has a difference in electronegativity that is greater than 2 um, is essentially no longer any sharing. There's no covalency behind that. It is completely ionic at that point in time. There's been a transfer of electrons, and we have full charges. Okay, so then how do we quantify this, or how do we measure this degree of um, charge separation that results in these polar bonds? Um, we, we utilize something called a dipole moment. So a dipole moment can be calculated um, and is proportional essentially to the, um, the size of the charge separation, right? So the larger the difference in electronegativity, um, the larger the, the partial charges that form, the larger the dipole moment. Um, as well as it's proportional to the distance between the two charges, right? So um, these are actual measurable things, and they do have units associated with them. And we usually represent these dipole moments as those little uh, positive um, with the arrow vectors. This is kind of usually how I represent um, this dipole moment that forms. So usually anytime we ask if, if a molecule or anything has a dipole, we're really asking, is that molecule polar um, is there this overall net dipole that forms? Okay, so go ahead and try some of these. This goes back to um, those differences in electronegativities and having a handle on um, what those mean in terms of the type of bond that forms. So I want you to look at a bond first off between strontium and fluorine, a bond between um, nitrogen and chlorine, and a bond between nitrogen and oxygen, and I want you to tell me whether or not these bonds are covalent, uh, polar covalent, or ionic. And again, covalent can be either pure or nonpolar. If it's polar, then we call it polar covalent, and then ionic is the, the very last one. Okay, so you may want to reference those uh, electronegativity values that are on that chart. Um, but go ahead and give us a try and then come back for the answer. Okay, so if we go through and we look up the values and electronegativities for these various atoms in these compounds, we find that strontium has a value of 1.0. Fluorine is the most electronegative element at 4.0. Um, so for this guy, if we look at just the difference between these two, and again, when I do this difference, I'm looking mainly at absolute value. I just want the magnitude of the difference between the two. Um, we find that there is a difference of three. Right? And just as a reminder, if we had that difference that was greater than 2, it was ionic. Right, So difference in electronegativity of 3 tells you that this is an ionic bond. For nitrogen and chlorine, um, if we look up the values, nitrogen has an electronegativity value of 3. Chlorine also has an electronegativity value of 3. So the difference between these two is 0. Right, So this is a situation where we'd have a pure uh, covalent with um, two different atoms, right? We had kind of introduced that with the same atom, but this nitrogen and chlorine bond also produces an electronegativity difference of zero, so it is a pure covalent bond. And then finally, we have nitrogen and oxygen. So nitrogen is electronegativity of three, oxygen is 3.5. So the difference here ends up being 0.5, and that was kind of like the cutoff for the polar covalent. So if we had a difference between 0.5 all the way to 1.9, this did give us a polar bond, a polar covalent bond. And so because of that, this is also a polar covalent bond. Okay, so again, unless it's like in the homework, I'm not going to necessarily have you calculating these unless I give you the values. Um, so potentially if I if I were to give you a question like this, you would be given the values of electronegativity so that you could calculate these. But I wouldn't tell you the cutoffs, right? So you do need to be aware that um, 0.5 to 1.9 is polar covalent. 
Um, pure covalent is zero. Anything greater than two is ionic. And then nonpolar covalent is 0.1 to 0.4. Okay, so uh, last couple things we're going to talk about have to deal with um, some trends with respect to bonds. Um, so specifically, we'll start with bond energy. Um, so the bond energy is, is de defined as the energy required to break a bond um, in the gas state homolytically, right? So just as a note, when we undergo chemical reactions, anytime we break bonds, energy always has to be supplied to do that. It always requires energy to break bonds. So you can kind of consider that um, an endothermic process, right? There has to be energy, has to come be absorbed from the surroundings. Um, but when we actually form bonds, when we make new things after breaking them, um, then that's usually going to release energy. That's going to be what we consider an exothermic process. Okay, so first off, number one, what is bond energy? Again, I just said that it is the energy required to break a bond, specifically in the gas state and homolytically. That's not necessarily important. I will just define what homolytic means. Um, so let's say that we had a chlorine molecule and then we broke this chlorine-chlorine bond in a homolytic fashion, right? So what happens here is that this bond is going to break evenly, and one of these electrons is going to go to this chlorine, and the other of this electron is going to go to this chlorine, right? So that's what we mean by homolytic. So we have, at the end of this, two chlorines that have taken one electron to one atom, the other electron goes to the other atom. That's what we mean by a homolytic bond cleavage reaction. Now, what we're calculating here is the energy required to do this, right? So the bond energy for um, breaking this chlorine-chlorine bond homolytically ends up being about 243 kilojoules. Um, and so depending on the bond that you're looking at depends on these bond energies. And we're actually going to be given these tabulated lists that we're going to be able to utilize in a second to actually estimate the overall enthalpy of a reaction just given the bonds that we're actually going to break and the bonds that we're actually going to form. Okay, so then before we talk about that, um, there are some trends with respect to bond energies that you guys need to be aware of. Um, so the first trend is overall the more electrons that two atoms share between each other, the larger the bond energy, right? The larger the amount of energy that is required to break that bond. So for example, um, if we looked at a carbon-carbon triple bond um, and compared the bond energy of that to a carbon-carbon double bond, note that as we decrease the number of electrons shared between the two atoms, we decrease the overall bond energy, right? So first off, um, overall, the more electrons shared, then the larger the bond energy shared. It's a hard one today larger bond energy, more energy required to break. And then second, another trend has to do with the length of uh, the overall bond, right? So just as a reminder, when we deal with bond links, we'll mention this in a second, um, but bond links are really heavily influenced by atomic radius. And if you guys remember back to the previous chapter, we had a trend in atomic radius as we move from left to right across the periodic table, we found that atomic radius decreased. And as we move from top to bottom across the periodic table, we found that atomic radius increased. Right, so overall, depending on the bond that you're looking at, the smaller the atom that's part of the bond, this, the shorter the bond is, right? So for example, let's compare a bromine fluorine, a bromine fluorine bond to a bromine chlorine bond to a bromine-bromine bond, right? So note that we're comparing bromine to another thing, right? And what we find in comparing bromine to, or fluorine to chlorine to bromine is what we're doing here is we're increasing the overall um, bond length, right? This is gonna be the shortest bond because again, fluorine, chlorine, bromine all lie in the same column of the periodic table, and as we move from fluorine to chlorine to bromine, we increase atomic radius, right? So as we increase atomic radius, we're going to increase the overall bond length. So this bond between bromine and fluorine is going to be the shortest because fluorine is the smallest atom. This bond is medium. This bond is biggest, I guess, because again, bromine is the largest atom of the three. 
Um, and if you notice what happens with respect to these bond energies, as we increase the bond length, we decrease the bond energy, right? So the shortest bond had the highest bond energy, the largest bond had the lowest bond energy. Right, so what we'll find as we move from left to right across the periodic table, we're gonna decrease atomic radius, we're gonna decrease bond length, and therefore we're gonna increase the bond energy. And then as we move from top to bottom, we're increasing radius, we're increasing bond length, we're decreasing bond energy. Okay, so now we're gonna be able to utilize kind of all of this stuff um, to help us calculate enthalpies of reaction. Um, with the bond energies that we've been talking about, right? So just note, again, that to break a bond, you're always going to have to supply energy to do that. And again, um, whatever the bond energy is for that bond, that's the amount of energy that you're going to have to supply. Um, but then once you've broken all the bonds and new bonds are allowed to form, formation of bonds is um, going to release energy, right? So overall, it's going to be an exothermic process. So if we have a chemical reaction where we go from reactants to products, we can essentially estimate the overall enthalpy of that reaction, right? So the overall enthalpy of that reaction by taking the sum of the bonds broken and subtracting from that the sum of the bonds formed. Right, so what we're gonna end up having here is a positive overall for the bonds broken because again, we're required to put that amount of energy in to break those bonds, but then we're gonna have a negative or exothermic process for the bonds form. Right, so again, what do we mean by bonds broken, bonds formed? So anytime you're gonna be faced with a problem like this, you're gonna be given a list of tabulated values for the various types of bonds that you could see. So for example, you'd be given a list like this, right? Where it gives you a different type of bond and it tells you the overall bond energy, okay? Okay, so note, I'm referencing this list in the next problem. So when you question where I get these values from, um, just note that I'm coming back to this list and I'm taking them directly from it. Also note at the very end here, this guy, that for a carbon-oxygen double bond, it's this, but when it's in CO2, it's 799. Just note that because it will be important. Okay, so let's utilize these concepts and then the values for the bond energies found in that table um, to estimate or calculate the overall enthalpy for the following reaction, where we take methane, we combine it with water to form hydrogen gas and CO2. Okay, so first thing we need to do is we need to figure out, right, what bonds we are breaking because we're going to utilize this overall equation, delta H, is equal to the sum of bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds formed. Right, so we are given our reactants and we are given our products. And when we're looking at bonds broken, we're always going to be looking at what bonds are we breaking in the reactants. Right? We're going to take our reactants, we're going to break all those bonds, and then we're going to form all of our bonds from our products, okay? All right, so now before we can do that, well, we see CH4, right? How do I know what type of bonds I'm gonna be breaking? So this is where the whole idea behind Lewis structures, what we've just learned, is gonna come in handy, right? So first off, I'm gonna go ahead and draw the Lewis structure for CH4. So carbon is my central atom. It's gonna be surrounded by four hydrogens. If I sum up the valence electrons, there's only eight. So we're gonna make single bonds, single bonds, and everyone is happy, right? So that is methane, that is CH4. This is gonna react with two waters, right? So the Lewis structure for water looks like this, but there are two of them. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw the second one. Um, and then this is gonna to go to form hydrogen. So we draw the Lewis structure for hydrogen, it's just H2 with a single bond. Um, but there are four of those, so I'm going to go ahead and draw four of those. And then there's a CO2, right? And so we've drawn CO2 kind of ad nauseum at this point in time. We know uh, that the best Lewis structure for CO2 is carbon, central atom, two double bonds to the terminal oxygens. Okay, so now, once I have everything drawn, I have the structure of everything so that I know what bonds I'm dealing with, I'm going to go through 
and I'm going to figure out what type of bonds I'm breaking, right? So I'm going to start over here with CH4. I'm going to break all of the bonds for my reactants, right? So for example, one of the bonds I have to break is this carbon hydrogen bond. But notice that I have to break everything. So that I'm going to do that essentially four times, right? So my first little step here for bonds broken is four carbon hydrogen bonds. Other things that need to break are these oxygen hydrogens, right? But again, I need to do all of those, right? So I'm going to break one, two, three, four. So those are other bonds that I'm going to have to break. So we have four times oxygen, hydrogen, whatever that is. And this is essentially all of the bonds that I have to break. All right, we're going to take the sum of those guys. So we have delta H is equal to these guys. I'm going to leave them as just this. We're going to actually put in the values in a second. Now I have to identify what type of bonds I'm going to form. So I've broken everything. Now I'm going to reform everything. So this is a hydrogen. Hydrogen is going to form, and it's going to do that four times. So for bonds formed, we need to form four hydrogen, hydrogen. And then we also need to form a carbon-oxygen double bond, and we need to do that twice. Okay, so again, it's bonds broken, some of them minus bonds form. So now we've identified everything. All we need to do is plug in the values for these various bond energies. And again, that's going to come from the table. So for example, if I look up in the table, the bond energy for a carbon-hydrogen bond, I find that that is uh, 414 kilojoules. If I look up the bond energy for an oxygen-hydrogen bond, I find that that is 464. If I look up hydrogen-hydrogen, I find that that is 436. And then again, if I look up carbon-oxygen, I think that's 439. But then specifically in CO2, it is 7, not 4, no, it's 739. But then in CO2, it's 799. And again, this is a double bond. The other things were triple bonds or single bonds. Note the very large increase in bond energy. Okay, so once I have everything plugged in, it's just doing the math. So we have delta H is equal to, I end up with a 1656 plus a 1856 minus a 1744 plus a 1598. This is going to give me an overall bond energy that is positive. So this process is endothermic, or this reaction is. And it ends up being a positive of 70. And the units here are kilojoules. Okay, so a couple different steps. Number one, draw the Lewis structures for your reactants and your products. Identify what bonds you're breaking, the number of them, and identify what bonds you're forming. Look up the bond energies for those various bonds, plug them in, and calculate the total. All right, so go ahead and try this one, and then uh, pause the video, come back for an answer. Again, the important part of this is drawing the Lewis structures for these, right? So that's number one. Um, once you've drawn the correct Lewis structures, then you can look up the correct bond energies. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over this one. Again, to calculate this overall enthalpy for this reaction using bond energies, we need to first figure out what bonds we break, and then we need to figure out what bonds we form. Um, to do that, we need to draw the Lewis structures. So first off, we have nitrogen. This is diatomic nitrogen. If we draw the Lewis structure, there's 10 electrons. We can say, oh, single bond, single bond. 
and then try to fill in the outer octets, except we end up, that's 10 electrons, there's not an octet around anybody, so we gotta take this guy, uh-oh, and make a double bond, uh, still not an octet, so I gotta do it again, take this guy, we'll make a double bond, or a triple bond at this point, and that's gonna be our Lewis structure for N2, right? So you don't have to do that, but, I mean, you do have to do that, you have to recognize that, but if you already knew it was two nitrogens with a triple bond, you could just write that down. Um, with that, we have three hydrogens. So again, we have a hydrogen, hydrogen, a hydrogen, hydrogen, and a hydrogen, hydrogen three times. This is going to go to form two ammonias, right? So if we drew the Lewis structure for ammonia, nitrogen's in the middle. It's surrounded by three hydrogens, but then there ends up being a lone pair on the nitrogen. And then we do that twice. Okay, so now. Those are our structures. We're going to figure out what bonds we break. So for bonds broken, we've got bonds broken. We come in, we've got to break this nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. So we have one of those, nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. We also have to break hydrogen-hydrogen. So we've got one, two, three of these guys. So this is plus three. Hydrogen, hydrogen. And then we're going to sum the bonds formed. We're going to kind of get smeared here. Um, so note, we've got a nitrogen, hydrogen, three times, and then six times. Right. So overall, we've got six nitrogen, hydrogen bonds that we are forming. All right, so then you go in and you look at the values. Um, so that nitrogen-nitrogen bond is large, that triple bond, that is 946 kilojoules per mole, um, plus three times the hydrogen-hydrogen, which was that 436. We're gonna subtract from that six times nitrogen-hydrogen, which is 389. So again, we do more math. We end up over here with the 2,254 when I sum all of these guys together. And then for our bonds formed, it's a 2,334. All right, so overall, we get a negative value here. This ends up being negative 80 kilojoules. Oops. And then again, with respect to the units, this is kilojoules per mole, if you look back at it. But anytime we multiply the number into that, it cancels the mole. So multiplying that one in cancels the mole. That's why we only end up in units of kilojoules here. All right, so hopefully you guys got that, and that makes sense. And you're capable of doing that on your homework. Okay, so then we've kind of already mentioned bond lengths. I should just note, though, that um, overall we kind of measure uh, bond lengths with respect to two individual atoms as the distance between the two nuclei that make up the bond. Um, and there are a lot of different ways that we measure this, um, but whenever we reference the actual length of bonds, um, we reference it in terms of kind of like the average bond length, right? So in all these different ways that we measure bond length, we take an average, and that's what we reference anytime we're actually referencing the distance between nuclei and a bond, okay? Um, so note, obviously, these guys are super close together. If you guys look over here, um, as we compare the bond links between um, a diatomic fluorine, a diatomic chlorine, bromine, and iodine, the PM is not like the time, it's not, you know, afternoon time. This is in picometers, right? So pico was that 10 to the minus 12th prefix multiplier. So this is very, 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 very tiny, tiny, tiny distances, obviously. Um, yeah, so there's only a couple of things I want to mention about this, and it has to do with the trends, and I've already referenced them kind of a little bit. So just note that with respect to bond links, you should be aware of the trends in bond length, um, which is what I'm going to talk about next. To what we saw with respect to bond energies, okay? So there are going to be two general trends depending on what we're looking at, okay? So number one, the first trends deal with how many electrons a bond contains, right? So for example, if we look at the difference between a triple bond versus a double bond versus a single bond, how do these guys differ with respect to the number of electrons? How many 
electrons does a triple bond have? Six electrons. So a triple bond contains six electrons. A double bond, how many does it have? Four electrons. And then a single bond has two electrons. So the more electrons that a bond contains, the shorter the overall bond. Okay, that is the big trend with respect to number of electrons. So the more the electrons that make up a bond, the shorter the bond. Okay, so then a triple bond is going to be much shorter than a double bond, much shorter than a single bond. So then the second little trend deals with bond lengths um, as we move across a period. So this is very similar to what we saw with bond energies. Okay, so what we're looking at in the second little trend is the bond length as a function of the size of the atoms that are actually binding together, making a bond. Okay, so with respect to size of atoms, we utilize our trend in atomic radius to kind of gauge the overall size of an atom. So what happens as we move from left to right across a period, across a row, with respect to the atomic radius of the atoms? Do they increase or decrease? So as we move from left to right across a period, we see a decrease in atomic radius. So again, this is just a measure of the overall size of atoms. What about as we go from top to bottom? We go from top to bottom with respect to the periodic table. What happens to atomic radius? We see an increase. Okay, so we're going to see very similar trends with respect to bond lengths. So the shorter the thing that is making up a bond, the smaller the bond length. Okay, so if we compared bond lengths between atoms moving across a period, so we compared, for example, the bond length of carbon to carbon, or carbon to nitrogen, or carbon to oxygen. Between carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, who is the shortest? Who is the smallest atomic radius? Because these guys all exist in the exact same row, the exact period. So same row between carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. So who is the smallest atomic radius? Oxygen, right? So oxygen has the smallest radius. So because of that, we're going to see the shortest bond between carbon and oxygen. Okay, so as we move from left to right, across a row, across a period, we're going to see a decrease in bond length. And again, this just goes back to the overall size that you guys should know because you understand the trends in atomic radiuses. Okay, so. As we move from left to right, we're going to see a decrease in bond length. So things at the right side of the periodic table are going to have smaller bond lengths. What about as we move from top to bottom? We see an increase in atomic radius. So how is that going to translate in terms of bond lengths? They're going to get larger, right? So as moving from top to bottom, we're going to see an increase in bond lengths. And this is very similar to what we saw with respect to bond strengths, right? Because overall, the longer the bond, the weaker the bond. Okay, so the longer the bond, the less energy is going to be required to break it. So the smaller the bond energies. Okay, so these all kind of go hand in hand with respect to one another. Okay, so the more electrons, the smaller the bond, the smaller the atomic radius, the smaller the bond, etc. Okay. Okay, so this last little bit that we're going to talk about, everything that we've been looking at thus far has been dealing with covalent bonding, right? So covalent bonding involves the sharing of electrons. So we haven't talked necessarily about ionic bonding. So that's what we're going to kind of mention very briefly at the end here.